pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wait for my statement for a moment, Sal. Hey, silence. Everyone have a great day. All right. Most of you are here. I appreciate you continuing to come to class. It matters. We are not done. In fact, you will have an exam next Friday. So that is a. Uh, you'll have an exam. That's not a surprise. Oh, the EOC? No, this class does not have an EOC. This class will have a benchmark five. Don't know if it's because next Friday. That's right. This is the modern era, all right? I'll take you a cold war to the modern era. We're not done yet. You got some notes in front of you. We got a little bit next week. I'm going to examine that Friday. What do I owe you for an exam? What do I all give you? Study guide. Study guide, right? Study guide. Study guide scavenger hunt, which tends to focus your attention to the right topics. If you will uh, pay attention to that, and of course, we'll know more of you along the way. So I'm just letting you know, I've got some shocked faces here. Letting you know that we have an exam next Friday, unified. Most of the classes in the school have five whole units, so it's not a not a surprise that we're going all the way to the end of the school year. Uh, and I, that was just a reminder. I didn't realize we would have a surprise face on that. But yeah, exam next Friday, so that's why coming to school continues to matter. Pull out the notes. Pull out the notes to say Cold War, and you do have some gaps in it. That's because we're going to finish it up today. In particular, it's a two-pager. Turn to the very back page. Turn to what would be page four. Oh, front back, front back. Turn to page four. What do you see there? Oh, vocabulary. Uh, no, uh, not vocabulary. Who, what? Wait, what's uh, happening? What? So read the instructions on the left hand column. I feel like some of you haven't gotten there yet. Choose one of the additional articles posted in Google Classroom today. The following question. Choose one of the additional articles. If you pay attention to Google Classroom, which I know some of you got it on your phone, you got it on the app. I posted, I made a post that has five additional links related to what we've been talking about. Cold War, Vietnam War, Korean War, which is what we're talking about today. A couple of links that kind of open up our topics even more. And this is putting it on you. You've got to read one of those articles and basically summarize it. As I've taught you to think like a historian, who, what, when, where, why, what is the significance of the event that you're reading about. It's also your choice. You don't have to read all five articles. You choose one. So of whatever we've been talking about that maybe you have the most interest in, you want to read more about it, that is a choice of an article there for you. So I think I'll be able to give you some time at this at the end of this class to maybe get started on that. However, if I don't uh, have time for that, I'm not taking these up today. I'm taking it up on Monday. That leaves it to you to do some reading over the weekend of whatever article you choose. If you have a personal technology issue, as in your family doesn't have the internet and you have no way to connect to uh, uh, the technology, right? As in, if that's your situation, you can come to me. I'll help you get one of these articles. I'll print it out for you. But these articles, boop, pull up on your phone. Safari, Chrome, whatever you use. So I know we're a pretty connected society these days. There's probably not a lot of reasons that you wouldn't be able to get connectivity to one of these articles. But it's on Google Classroom, it's also on you. We're leveling up in our responsibility. I'm stepping you into 10th grade, stepping you into US history as well. There'll be a lot of US history situations where we say, okay, that's the lesson of the day, and now you gotta do some extra on your own. Reading, writing, thinking, okay? Not everything that comes up, you know, just because it comes out of my mouth, uh, that's not the end all be all. There's still some reading for you to do. Welcome, welcome to responsibility, welcome to kind of the higher level of learning that will be expected next year. So this is just a step to that, right at the end of your world history class. I just wanted you to know that that back page is gonna require your extra effort. It is not gonna be accomplished in class. It's gonna require your extra effort. So can I get a thumbs up on that? Groovy, gravy, you understand what I said? Cool. We're about to go into the hallway to open our class today. We can't be maniacs out there because there are other classrooms, although we're gonna have fun for just a minute here, okay? So let's go to the hallway. I want you to line the hall kind of long way. Line the hallway long ways. I'm going to explain what we're going to do. Can we bring the computer out there?
Oh my god, my math is all perfect. Six inches, y'all, six inches. Six inches, y'all, six inches. That's as long as you can get it. Somebody be the ruler guy. You're not the ruler guy. I'm the stick guy. All right. You can't hold my stick and then you just talk. No more balls. But I need them more. But we got to do this. Cozy, you're my quarterback, man. Right. Thank you. 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 It can fill my whole food. I'm going to give you two shots at it, but not if you take too long. Which way are we knocking it from? Knock it right into my computer. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, I think it's time to practice our first round. Let me give us a countdown, though. I want to make sure we, we all see it happen. We got a couple of blocks. Y'all got to see me. Y'all got to see me do this. Oh, hey, did they not get it this way? Wow, the camera's out here. Yeah. So, let me knock it down. Let me knock it down. Let me knock it all right. Give us a three, two, one. Two, one. I told you. Knock it out. Knock it out. Oh, yeah. 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 Let's go ahead and clean it up and come back on in. I know they're not traditional dominoes, so the weight of them wasn't quite perfect. But clean it up. Come on in. I'm going to make a point about it. Note to self. Get dominoes next time. Where's the bag? It's a black bag, right? <laughs> go back, go back. Oh God, what's that? All right, y'all. So today we're talking about this. What is this? Oh wait, everybody's like, no, today. Kyrie, you meet each other. It all starts with the pointer stick. It all starts with the pointer stick. Yeah, the camera saw it too. Thanks, thanks. I did. I almost took a picture between. I pulled one. I got one. No. Yeah, it's not good. Well, she should have said, go to the last one. This is awesome to see. All right, good job, y'all. Good job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, bro. Oh. <laughs> All right. Now, while while the dominoes did not quite fall like I expected they would, note to self for future classes, I'm gonna get some. Huh? Hey, just let's just move on. All right, cool. While the dominoes did not fall quite like I expected they would, note to self is that next time we'll be hit some real dominoes for my class. Why did we do that little activity? What have I mentioned to you in the past two days that Dominic. might? Dominic. Um, yes, got Jackie. Yeah, so we discussed the domino theory of containment in that, and that is the belief that if one country falls to communism, more would follow. And it wasn't just a random belief that, you know, I don't know which country is going to be next, our national security advisors kind of mapped out the order that they thought these countries would fall. China is communist. China could threaten Korea. Korea, if Korea falls to communism, would topple Vietnam. Vietnam borders Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Burma, India. Boom, 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 boom. Now, our little activity kind of gave me one more talking point that I didn't really plan on. When one of the towers did not fall, what would we say that could be comparable to? Uh, uh, stop it. Oh, what is it called? Stopping it, yeah. What's the terms we've used? Containment, yeah. I didn't do that on purpose. I really didn't know that they wouldn't topple quite as well. But when one of them did not fall, when the next one did not fall, that's almost like saying containment has stopped it. So had a little fun in the hallway. You guys worked as a team a little bit. I appreciated the leadership that stepped up. I want you to remember the domino theory of containment, the belief that if one country fell to communism, many countries might fall to communism. And today, what we're going to be talking about is containment in action. See, it's one thing to say we believe in containment. Our philosophy is that we're going to put a lid on communism and not allow it to spread. That's just words if you don't back it up. So anytime a president spits out a policy or a doctrine, 
he better be willing to back it up with action. And we are going to see President Truman's doctrine and his policy of containment in action in two big ways. So this is a major chunk of American and world history in class today. We're talking about two major wars, about as, about as fast as I possibly can talk about them. We're talking about the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Now, people in life give their whole selves to studying just a portion of either of those. People become experts on the Korean War. People become experts and scholars on the Vietnam War. We today, we're going to spend about an hour talking about both wars. Definitely not time to make an expert in them, but I hope that maybe I'll inspire some curiosity. You know, maybe you'll want to become a lifelong learner. Yeah, nod your head with me. And uh, that's what the whole class is here, is that we're trying to give you a, a reason to want to be curious about U.S. history, about American history, uh, and world history at that. Because it's your history, right? This is the story of your country and the world that you live in. So with all that said, today we're going to talk about the Korean War and the Vietnam War. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. I got a couple of videos. It's a little bit of a brain break along the way. Uh, and then, of course, there's so much more out there to be said. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And a couple of your optional articles relate to the Korean War and the Vietnam War. So if you have curiosity, maybe you want to dive more into that in that way. As a reminder, Thea really just kind of brought this up for me. Did you, Thea, Thea did you know I had this slide next? I want to remind you about the difference between the Cold War, remember, is a period of tension. A hot war, which maybe we don't really say that phrase, but a shooting war, right? The opposite of a cold war is a shooting war. Well, Korea and Vietnam are both good examples of a proxy war. A proxy war is when a major power expresses its personal diplomacy through a lesser power, uh, and that lesser power goes to war almost on behalf of the bigger power. So in this case, we're going to see South Korea and South Vietnam going to war against the North. In both, in both cases, the Americans support the South and the Communists support the North. Now, the Americans, Americans do get involved, but by and large, we use the other fighters to express our, 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 our goals and our desires. Okay? So a proxy war is using another country to kind of do the fighting for us. So both of these are pretty good examples of proxy war. Korean War. Let's go ahead and get into the Korean War. Picture of the Korean Peninsula. You can see that the land varies. It borders the water. There's highs, there's lows. That's just one snapshot. There's plenty more of geography in Korea that looks much like that as well. I've got a question for you. Have you ever seen the Korean War depicted on the screen before? A movie or a TV show, yeah, maybe? I saw it. Hang on. Aiden had a hand first. I forgot the movie. Forgot the movie. It is, I think that's a Korean Okay. Anybody's parents, or maybe even grandparents, have a favorite TV show that's about the Korean War? I bet you're about to read the Andy Griffith Show. The Andy Griffith Show, close-ish. About Mash. Anybody ever seen Mash before? Mash for oh man, I'm so sad that Mash is just past your generation. I watched that. Add to the older show. All right, it came out in the '70s. However. It is frequently on reruns on channels like the CW or uh, number, number this is probably the main channel that it's on. This is called MASH. May, your grandparents definitely know about MASH, all right? Your parents maybe, but your grandparents definitely, because it's a very popular TV show uh, while they were growing up. And MASH is about the Korean War. MASH is really about the only major TV show or, uh, or even movie that's about the Korean War, because very often the Korean War is called the Forgotten War. A reason it might be called the Forgotten War is because actually it's not a war. War was never declared in Korea. Now we call it the Korean War, okay? And in you know, if, if in books and on an exam or something like that, it is going to be referred to as the Korean War. But do you remember what I said? America started to see ourselves as the global what? Superpower. Superpower, but also the global police. Yes. We see ourselves as enforcing law and order around the world, global police or global cop. The Korean War is actually technically a police action. Nobody says the Korean police action. The war was never declared. So to call it the Korean War is somewhat of a mislabel because war was technically never declared. Now on your page here, I got the Korean War. This is what I want you to write. A war fought by the U.S. from 1950 to 1953. 
How far after World War II did this happen? When did World, World, War, II, when did World War II end? 1949. 1945. Five. Okay. So this war begins in 1950. We only had five years of not being at war. Do you think Americans wanted to go back to war or not? No. Yeah. American Americans did not really have an appetite for going back to war. We just come off of the world stinking war, uh, and we we're tired. You know, a lot of people were making their lives, going to college, starting a business, having families. Not a lot of people wanted to go back to war, but the reason we did was to contain communism in Korea. So you got to kind of connect those years and realize that people probably didn't want to go to war. Yeah, just a Chromebook. You guys out of them? Yeah. Met. Probably charged. Uh, so that's the years of the fighting. The communists support the North and the U.S. supports the South. And this next statement is pretty important because this is going to be the starting point and the ending point of the war. These two countries are divided at what's known as the 38th parallel. Parallel is a line of latitude. So there's actually not a physical boundary at the 38th parallel. There's not a river that crosses right there. There's not a mountain range where you might say north of the mountains is their country, south of the mountains is my country. It's just a line. It's an invisible line on the map called a line of latitude known as the 38th parallel. So I'm going to show you some maps here uh, along the way, and you'll be able to see where the, where the Korean Peninsula has been divided. But that 38th parallel is where the war starts, that's where the war stops. And all the fighting that happened in between kind of feels like it was unnecessary because not much was gained or lost along the way, except, of course, for a lot of lives that were lost along the way. So you guys got this definition. I'm going to move on a little bit. If you want to write things down as we go, by all means, that's it. you got your sticky notes ready, all right? But for the rest of you, just listen. Okay? Just hear me. Just pay attention. If you want to write some side notes, go for it. Korean War. So there was a fear of communist takeover in Asia, just like I told you about the domino theory, and you saw that Korea was assessed to be the next one to fall. Big fear that if Korea fell to communism, all of Asia might fall to com communism. And this fear was exacerbated when North Korea invaded into the South, and that gave a lot of people fear that the communists were going to start to take over. So this is where President Truman had to put his money where his mouth was. He says, we've got these containment policies. Well, now we got to go back it up. We've got to go back it up with our military strength. And this is why the United States goes to South Korea to start defending our friends, the, uh, the, those who are not communists uh, who, who come from South Korea. So here's that map that I promised you. Let's take it back a half step. Let's even talk about before World War II. Before World War II, Japan annexes Korea as far back as 1910. All right, this is extra. This is not kind of, this is background information. So Japan has its flag planted on the Korean Peninsula all the way until the end of World War II. Well, do you remember what happened in Germany when we finally won the war? We're friends with the Soviets. We're friend, you know, so Soviets and Americans are friends for a moment. But what did that mean for Germany? Uh, well, we had to split it, right? We had to split Germany right down the middle. Half of Germany was administered by the Americans. The other half of Germany was administered by the Soviets. Same story in Korea. Since Japan lost the war, they obviously had to give up their claims in Korea. North Korea goes to the Soviet army because they, in the, in the north, they surrendered to the Soviet army. South Korea, the surrender happens to the Americans. So we almost get this nice little divide line, like, all right, Soviets, you keep control of the North, we'll keep control of the South. That's not to say that we are dominating their country. They are still Korea. But you administer to the North, we administer to the South. So not all that different from exactly what happened in, Ger uh, in Germany. We had to split the country in terms of who was going to lead it. So that means that that communist ideology is in the North, and then freedom, democracy, and capitalism are, are being, to, um, you know, uh, led in the South. Question? So in Germany, they split the capital city. That's exactly right. Split Berlin also right down the middle. We don't have that exact same thing here in Korea. Basically, North and South comes up with its own capital city. So, uh, yeah, I'm always amazed that Berlin got split right down the middle, even though it's kind of behind Soviet lines. We don't have the exact same thing going on here. So here's the map. It's called the Korean Peninsula because it's surrounded by water on all three sides. 
So you have now North Korea with the capital of Pyongyang, South Korea with the capital of Seoul. And now this sets the stage for uh, the United States getting back involved. The North invades the South in 1950. North, all things red right there, invades to the South in 1950. Well, since the U.S. is supporting the South and we are talking about containing communism, naturally we have to support our partners in the South with not just with talk, not just with money, but with actual troops. So we send troops to go fight in Korea, fight against the communists. Suffice it to say, this is one of the biggest summaries of all time, all right? You know, we, we don't have time to get into all the tactics and exactly how the war happened. Back, forth, back, forth for about three and a half years, and the war ends right back at that parallel, right as you see on the screen right there. Here's a little bit more descriptive. This map is a little bit more descriptive. So June of 1950, this is when the North invades to the South. A couple months later, September, you can see the North has darn near captured the whole peninsula. There's just a little bit of uh, capitalism remaining in the blue. This is when the United States gets involved. The United States comes through this town called Pusan and starts to push back against the North. So advance it again, September to November, the United States and other allies have pushed the north all the way back. So you see the yo-yo effect? It's like womp, 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 womp. This happened several times. And then July of 1953, we're right back to this middle ground. You see the dash line of the 38th parallel. The ceasefire happens shortly after that. And for all the back and the forth, all the shooting and the dying, the war ends with territory almost exactly where it started in the first place. So there's plenty of amazing stories that go into each of that. The Marines, the Army, the Air Force, everybody has you know stories of heroics from these various battles, these various movements. But the Korean War in four maps, this is about as summarized as I can make it. The sad end point, Abigail just said it, everything stopped right where it started in the first place. Why did we fight at all? Um, so that's kind of an interesting take on the Korean War, that it all just stopped where it started in the first place. A couple of key personalities, these are kind of key figures in U.S. history as well. So, Douglas MacArthur, he was also, he got his start at, uh, anybody want to take a guess where he went to college? That's right, Douglas MacArthur is a West Point graduate, class of 1903. He was first in his class, so I was not first in my class. That means he was a better cadet than I was. Um, so he has that background, right? He has a military academy background. He comes from uh, uh, yet yeah, the same college that I went to, that's true. Um, and something that's kind of significant about his, his life is that he's a three-war veteran. World War I, World War II, and then now he's risen to the rank of a five-star general, and he commands all forces in Korea. So World War I, World War II in Korea. Obviously a lot of experience. What you got? He looks like Andy Griffith. You know what? He looks like Barney Fife. Yeah. No. I see it a little bit. The khaki uniform and uh, the face just a little bit. Okay, I'll buy it. I'll buy it, Abigail. Now, uh, what you see him smoking there, except for the moving wispies uh, the, of wow. the smoke, that is actually that's a real photo. Okay, I did not add a I did not add a cartoon or anything like that to the picture. And, it, and what type of pipe is that? Can you tell? Uh, Tobacco tobacco pack. Well, I mean, you pack tobacco into it, but the pipe itself is made from a corn cob. So it's called a corn cob pipe. And he was very famous for always smoking a corn cob pipe. And that just kind of added to his toughness, his mystique, his allure. He was a rough and tough general. He had a lot of experience. Okay? He was pretty significant in the Pacific theater of World War II, which I know we didn't fully have time to talk about all that, but he comes through, he comes by a lot of experience. Five years later, America goes to war in Korea. He's the man who leads all forces in Korea. U.S. forces, but also United Nations forces. So he is the commander even for other countries. They are under him. So big guy, big important role that he has in the war. He wants to end the war just like we ended the war in Japan. Using what? He says, hey, we have this technology. It has worked before. And yes, you guys said it, I'll make sure I make that clear. Let's drop an atomic bomb on the Koreans. If the Chinese want to get involved, or they're trying to get involved, well, they can know that we've got this atomic bomb, 
and they better steer clear. We're going to drop an atomic bomb, and that way the war will be over again. That was his attitude. Now, we, you guys read a little bit about the atomic bombs, and uh, you know, President Truman's kind of had to, he wrestled with the, the idea of whether it was a good idea or not to use it, kind of had some personal struggles with whether he should use the bomb and kill a lot of people. President Truman's attitude is not the same as Douglas MacArthur. President Truman says, nope, we are not going to drop an atomic bomb. Even though we have the technology, we should not get into the habit of dropping atomic bombs just to solve our conflicts. This would be a bad thing for the world to just always resort to using atomic bombs. And I think we can agree with that. We talked about nuclear proliferation yesterday. I showed you how the bombs just got bigger over time. It would be a bad habit to get into every time countries had disagreements to start dropping nukes on each other. Bad habit to get into. So President Truman disagrees with MacArthur, and between the general and the president, who do you think's in charge? That's right, the president. The, even as high of a general as you get, which he was a five-star general, the president still outranks the general. So Truman disagrees with, with uh, uh, MacArthur. Of course, he says that publicly. He says, we're not going to use nuclear bombs on Korea. My general is not the one in charge. I'm in charge. MacArthur, on the other hand, a little bit big, um, too big for his own bridges, or his, his ego got oversized. He publicly disagrees with Truman. So that is going against the president. That would almost be like if I said something that goes against our superintendent. I'm just a classroom teacher. And then, of course, Ms. Rowland is the superintendent. She's the leader of our school district. I shouldn't be able to, I shouldn't disagree with her publicly. Or I shouldn't call her out publicly, right? That's not how the chain of command works. Same thing here. The, uh, the fact that the general disagreed with Truman publicly, and he almost was, uh, he was going to disobey some orders, right? The president gives orders, you better follow them. Well, long story short, Truman fired him. Okay? Nobody is above getting fired in life, and that's all for all of you who are going to join the workforce someday as well. Nobody is above getting fired. Even Douglas MacArthur got fired by President Truman. So over there, disagreements. Uh, now, even though his army career kind of ended on a sour note like that, he is, that's not what most people remember. He is held up as a very important leader in U.S. history. And in fact, yeah, there's 19-year-old Cadet Swanson, uh, part of West Point. One of the buildings is called MacArthur Hall, and he has a statue that's at West Point. That's the MacArthur statue. So that is, uh, that is freshman me standing next to the MacArthur statue. And what year would that be? 2006, 2007? So uh, anyway, even though his army career kind of ended on a sour note, uh, he is regarded as a he is regarded as an important leader in U.S. history and a respected general from from all of his service. World War One, World War Two, Korea, people remember Douglas MacArthur. So that's just a little bit of a biography on Douglas MacArthur, uh, and and I tell you that as it fits into the Korean War. Uh, let me finish up the end of the war here, and then we'll take our bathroom break because my timer just buzzed off. So here's the end of the war. It ends in a stalemate at the 38th parallel, and after all that fighting, Korea remains divided to this day. To this day, no peace treaty has ever been signed. One, it wasn't declared as a war. It's a police action. Two, no peace treaty has ever been signed. What they agreed to was an armistice, which is a laying down of the arms. They agreed to stop shooting, right? Ceasefire, armistice. But technically, to this day, there has not been a seat or a peace treaty ever signed. First thing is, it was never a war. Second thing is, to this day, no peace treaty has ever been signed. So that means, what's that? Technically, yeah, that, that, that if, if either side picked up their weapons and shot over the line to the other side, it kind of be like they resumed the hostilities uh, again. Now, this ceasefire has held for decades, 1953 all the way into the present day. That's almost, uh, what is that, 69 years, almost 70? Uh, but yes, but yes, Abigail, if uh, it's very tense peace, it's very tense ceasefire, if either side shot across at the other one, Maybe they would resume the hostilities. And there have been concerns about that in the past seven decades. There have been issues where maybe, just maybe, the ceasefire was going to be called off and they would go back to war. When we come back from our bathroom break, we'll talk about the uh, 38th parallel uh, a little bit more and what it looks like today. So.
Go ahead and take that break. You ain't gonna go back no longer? What's that, Logan? Are those JVCs? You see them? Yeah, I have to fire my kids. All right, come on in, take a seat. Let me get my break bacon brew on. So uh, you go ahead and look at this screen. These are the last things I kind of said. If you want to write that down, it might be more. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. All right. So, is that everybody? Am I missing anybody? All right. So, hey, uh, this last screen I just pulled up, the kind of things I just said, that headline there, war is over. Is that accurate? Um, Why? What's inaccurate about that headline? Uh, there was no war. war. It wasn't a war and two spiders. It wasn't over. It wasn't really over. That's exactly right. I'm glad you guys recognize that. So, 
what started to exist at that 38th parallel, I'm about to hand something around. It's a bit of a historical artifact. So I'm going to start two things on either side of the room, and y'all can just pass it around. And I'd ask you just to be respectful. See ya. Tell Hey. I'd ask you to be respectful of my artifacts, right? Just be careful as you handle it. Handle it. Also, this is just kind of a plastic cover. It is taped on the back. So just be careful as you hand it around. That's all I ask. That 38th parallel, that distance between North and South Korea, gets called the DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, often referred to as the DMZ. And what it is is a dead space between North and South Korea. On that, from the South, you can see the North. From the north, you can see the south, and either side has their soldiers on the far side of the DMZ. But the dead space in between, kind of like no man's land, they agree to not cross. They can see each other. They're walking with their rifles. They're patrolling, but they do not cross. And what is strung across the DMZ is a whole bunch of barbed wire. And this right here is an actual snip, about six inches of barbed wire, that came from the DMZ. And uh, I guess they replaced the barbed wire at one point, and it kind of got packaged by this particular township. It says, from the mayor of Paju City province. So I guess the, uh, the city that kind of has the DMZ right on it created this kind of commemorative little thing, barbed wire, that used to be on the 38th parallel. So whenever I look at an artifact, whether it's in a museum or it's kind of cool that I actually get to hold it into my hands like this, these are welcome. Get the whole, get the whole artifact in my hands like this. I, I kind of feel like I'm there. I kind of feel like uh, I'm holding a piece of history, and it kind of takes me to that place. So I'm going to start this on either side. Here's the actual barbed wire. I'll start with Abigail. And then the box kind of has a little bit of a description on it as well. I'll start the box on this side, and, you know, the artifact can go both directions. So uh, just kind of bringing Korea to you right here in Bacon County, Georgia. And you can see that artifact just a little bit, just a little bit. Oh, yeah, Abigail, that's a great question. What if you have family on the other side? Uh, that is a great point to make, and you would not be able to cross that line. Now, it is, um, at this point, 70 years later, it's unlikely that families are split, at least split directly. Now, when the war happens, maybe some people got caught in the north, some people got caught in the south, and their family got split. But at this point, 70 years later, with no crossover, your family is, you know, you're probably established on whichever side you're in. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about North Korea and how weird it is for the next couple minutes here. What did I call North Korea the other day? Uh, no, it's really probably oh, unicorn. Unicorn. unicorn, yeah, because unicorns are like mythical, magical. You wonder if they exist. They probably don't. Uni uh, North Korea is so bizarre. You guys get it right here? North Korea is so closed off, isolated, unconnected, or disconnected with the rest of the world that sometimes we really don't even know what goes on inside of it. And even more than that, the people in North Korea don't know what goes on in the rest of the world. They genuinely believe that their president is, is a supreme leader. He's called the supreme leader. He almost has kind of a religious or holy holiness given to him. They look up to him as the deity, a godlike figure. North Korea media, they will report things that are just like totally untrue about this man in a way to build up his reputation. Such as, they'll say that he hit a 500-yard hole-in-one on golf. Can anybody hit a 500-yard hole-in-one on golf? Okay. Nobody hits a golf ball that far, right? And if you see a picture of this man, I'm about to show you a picture of this man, you'll know that he's not an athlete. They will also say that he can run a two-hour marathon, and he's one of the best runners in the world. I'm going to tell you, this guy cannot run a two-hour marathon. You'll see that as soon as I show you the picture. So it is very interesting to think about what, what goes on inside of North Korea. Very, very few Americans make their way into North Korea, and you have to have a super special travel passport kind of thing to get there. It is unadvised to travel to North Korea. Uh, strangely enough, one American who's kind of broken, one American who's made his way to North Korea is Dennis Rodman. You guys know who Dennis Rodman is? Basketball player. Basketball player. That's right. He's called the Worm. He's kind of a weird guy. He played with Michael Jordan back in the 90s, won some championships with the Bulls. But for whatever reason, Dennis Rodman has kind of broken his way into North Korea. Oh, this one He's actually even met with the president. 
But what he finds, what he finds there is a society that has no understanding of the outside world. They do not have the internet. They do not have uh, news channels that show things from around the world. They have news stations that the president approves of. And as such, that means they only say things that the president wants his people to hear. So they go to school and they worship their supreme leader. They look at his photograph. They pledge allegiance to him. They are allowed to only have certain haircuts. They are allowed to only wear certain clothes. They are definitely limited on where they can live, what their house looks like, and how much food they have. So that is, by nature, that's part of the communist, communist nature of their country, is that the government tells them what they can have, what job they have, how much food they have, and how much clothes they have. You guys done with passing around? Start, or they need to make it to this side still, I think? No, they don't want to touch right. it. Now, so how do you think Americans have connected with North Korea over the past 70 years? How do you think the American government has connected with North Korea over the past 70 years? What do you think? You think our president is talking to their president? Mm -hmm. You know, for about 68 years, that is true. Until, and listen to me, hear me on this. Don't give a crap what you think about politics, you Donald Trump. your personal opinion for or against Donald Trump. He was a president. We're going to talk about what he did in history. Okay. In 2019, Donald Trump met with the president of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. This is actually the 38th parallel. This is the demilitarized zone. And what he's doing is stepping into, where's he stepping? North Korea. He's stepping into North Korea. So you can see that, obviously, that's the boundary. This is a guard shack in the north. There'd be a guard shack in the south as well. It kind of goes into their governmental buildings. But this is their this is their leader. Can he run a two-hour marathon? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that buddy can't run a two-hour marathon. No, I haven't run a one-hour marathon. But Donald Trump, Donald Trump is stepping into North Korea. Donald, excuse me. Donald Trump is meeting with That's Kim Jong Un right. and both of his chins. I got a question. That's the what's your question? What's your question? How does South Korea feel about this? How does South? Ooh, that's a good question. So, how do you think? Do you think it's better to talk to someone or to not talk to someone? Talk, talk to someone. About it. Yeah. He did not extend any privileges. He did not make any promises. He did not say we are now best friends. But at least he talked to them, right? Which had not happened for sixty-five plus years previously. So it's called a summit. They had a conversation. In the end, not a whole lot came from it, but they did talk. How does South Korea feel about it? I, you know, I can't speak for the whole country. I would guess some people appreciated that they were making a connection, whereas others thought he's the great enemy and we should never talk to him. So it probably goes both directions there. But no president before, and then, of course, there's only been one president since. No president since has talked to North Korea in the way that Donald Trump has. So very revolutionary moment. Uh, for a lot of time in history, people cannot imagine that. The American president shaking hands with the president of North Korea, the American flag standing right next to the flag of North Korea. Say what you want about Donald Trump. Think, what you, want. He's hungry. Think what you want about Donald Trump. He may, he uh, he was a master relationship builder and a negotiator. So it's pretty I powerful. Know. Pretty powerful. Like to be friends with him. That's one that's one country I would want to be friends with. Better to keep your enemies, you keep your friends close and your enemies closer, as they say, right? At least bring them into the fold I feel like so that he's not against you. I feel yeah. like they got a bunch of nuclear Yeah. Now, the conversation they had, I'm sure they talked about nuclear weapons. I'm sure that he tried to convince uh, President Kim Jong-un to uh, open his country to inspectors, uh, open his country to freedom and democracy and trade. Of course, that, that did not happen. That did not happen from just one conversation. But it's better to have a conversation than to not have a conversation, all right? Uh, let's take a look at North Korea. You want to see communism from space? Yeah. yeah. Did you know you can see communism from space? Yeah. yeah, you can. After I show you these pictures, you will. So Google Earth here, North Korea, South Korea. Here's the dividing line. You can even see that Google Earth itself doesn't have a lot of data on North Korea. It doesn't have any extra towns. It doesn't have any roads and highways listed. North Korea is kind of a black hole on the internet, even on the internet. Now this is, so here's the Korean Peninsula, here's South Korea, and you can see it's industrialized, there's lights, there's electricity, what do you, there's no lights, there's no lights, I got a couple of pictures to even show better, South Korea, North Korea, this is the capital city, they turn the lights on in the capital city, but what about the rest of the country? Nothing. South Korea kept the city light, oh. Yeah, so capitalism. Communism, I'll show you one more here. Capitalism, 
communism. You tell me now which which system do you want to live under? Right? So literally a black hole. When they say turn the lights out, you do. When they say you can't connect to the internet, you don't. That is a totalitarian uh, way of living. And this is the present day. Okay, this is not 70 years ago. This is today. Capitalism, communism. You can see the difference from space. And just one more picture there kind of showing you the same thing. Uh, the Korean War, often called the Forgotten War, and I even told you it's not a war at all, it's a police action. It does have a memorial in Washington, D.C. It's actually a very beautiful memorial. What you have here is it looks like a group of soldiers on patrol. It looks like it's cold because they have a lot of their winter clothing on. But uh, whenever I, I've viewed this thing a couple times, I've been able to go to Washington, D.C. a couple times in my life. Well, you have been able I to almost go. feel like I've been on this patrol before. Right. To, so to see it as a kid before I joined the Army was one thing. But then to see it again as an adult after I've been in the Army, it kind of had a totally different reaction to it. Because I see the guys walking with a rifle. I see one guy on the radio. I see like they're almost they got their head on a swivel. They're listening for bad guys. Right. They're listening for enemy movements. And they're very also they're also very spread out. This is over about 100, 150 yards because in a combat patrol, you all going to be spread out so that the enemy can't take out all of you at the same time. And it's just a very beautiful, it's a very beautiful memorial, and it does recognize the veterans, those who served in Korea, those who died in Korea. Picture of a uh, picture of me when I got to go view it right there. And I do remember one time, not this picture right here, because you can tell it's kind of a clear day. But one time I got to view it, it was very foggy, and I almost walked up on it by accident, right? Because because with the fog, I couldn't see what was coming next, and then these soldiers kind of appeared out of the mist. It's a very beautiful, very powerful moment. So should you ever get the chance to go and visit Washington, D.C., and guys, it's only about six hours away, okay? I know that only, you got, only I know hours. you can't drive yet, and I know that you're kind, of, you're kind of connected to your family for if you get to go on vacation with them or whatever. But let me challenge you, okay? A lot of people have the attitude that I'm in, in Alma, and this is where I live, this is where I'm going to be. Travel. Go somewhere. You can live here. I live here. Who so travel, my friends? Let me challenge you to travel. Washington, D.C. is not that far away. And maybe you just need to mention it to your family. Hey, you know what's pretty cool? That's not that far away. Washington, D.C. We should go take a visit. So, anyway, that's my recommendation. So, it's only on away. All right. We got to keep on so keeping on go. because this is a power pack class. More containment in action. What was that next domino that might fall? Vietnam. Vietnam, yes. What do you know about American involvement in Vietnam? Vietnam, we fought a war there. Okay, so just like we put containment into action in Korea, we're also going to put containment into action in Vietnam. And you got a couple terms related to Vietnam, so whenever I get to that screen, I'll give you time to write it. But uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, I'm going to try to tell you some stories, and I got to keep in mind what our time is, so I got to go kind of rapidly here as well. There it is again, that belief that communism, if one country falls to communism, others would fall. Of course, that's a thumb down. Yeah, Vietnam would be next on the list. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how we got involved in Vietnam in the first place. And you see the screen, or you see on your notes there, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Let me tell you how the U.S. got involved in Vietnam. The United States was supporting South Vietnam against the communist North Vietnam. So it's really it's the exact same setup. We support the South against the North. That's good. You don't have to memorize something else. We support the South against the North. Well, at first, small differences from the, store, the war in Korea. At first, we don't send troops right away. We send advisors. We send equipment. We send a couple of ships to the water near Vietnam. And these ships are kind of helping the South Vietnamese uh, Marines conduct attacks into North Vietnam. Well, two of these ships are allegedly attacked by North Vietnamese ships. I say allegedly because it's actually not ever been fully proven that it was an attack. But the president at the time, President Lyndon Johnson, he wants to use military force in Vietnam. He wants to put containment in action, but he needs approval from Congress to do that. So what he says is, hey, our ships got attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. Gulf of Tonkin is a waterway just off of Vietnam. And since our ships got attacked, we need to go attack back. 
Congress, I need approval to go attack into North Vietnam. Well, think about the attitude of the American people. If we got attacked, what do you want to do? We're going to fight back, right? You can't mess with us. You can't mess with the United States Navy. You can't mess with the United States military. So Congress does approve. Congress gives its approval for the president to use force in Vietnam. All necessary means in order to fight back in Vietnam. Now, what is a little fishy about this on, uh, on the back side of history is we're not really sure these ships got attacked. They say that they saw boats coming at them on a foggy morning. But it might have just been fishermen boats. It might not have been enemy boats. They actually didn't get they didn't get sunk. They didn't get torpedoed, but they got they say they got threatened. The president uses that to get what he wants. So lying, changing the truth, shady, white lies, however you want to say it. And Abigail says the president could have told him to say that. Yeah, that's exactly right. The president used the alleged attack to get what he wanted, which was authorization to use force. I'm going to show you this picture here. This is the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> Look at this. All great men use pointer sticks, right? All great teachers use pointer sticks. So just like he, just like I use a pointer stick on this screen all the time, what he's doing is showing the American people what happened. This is Vietnam. This is the Gulf of Tonkin. Our ships were attacked right here. That's what he's doing. And he convinces the American people and Congress that, uh, that, our, that we were attacked and that we need to attack back. So from this comes the official Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution gives the president authorization to conduct military operations in Southeast Asia without what? Without a declaration of war. Oh, man. It's like copy and paste. Same song, second verse. Here we go again. The Vietnam War is technically not a war. The war was never declared. So I know we call it a war, right, in our language, in our books, in our history texts, whatever. We say the Vietnam War. But just like Korea, it is technically not a war. The war was never declared. Military actions, but not war. This is a marked change in policy in the way the United States behaves. Previously, we were, what's the I word? Isolationist. Isolationist. We stay out of the conflict until we get drawn in. And something like Pearl Harbor, right, drew us into World War II. But this is a change. Instead of waiting to get drawn in, now we're going in first. And we're not even declaring war, technically. We're just going in even without declaring war. Question? Great question. We'll get to that in the end, Abigail. So this is the actual Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Now, of course, you don't have to, I don't expect you to read all of that page there, but what is that finger pointing to on the resolution? It's going to a blank space, right? And you can see the text on the screen. What is supposed to be in that space? An expiration date. Congress passes this resolution without an expiration date. So they didn't say you can use troops for 30 days. They didn't say you can use troops till the end of the year. This expires on de December 31st. They didn't say you can use troops for three years. They gave an open expiration date, which leads to the Vietnam War lasting for the next almost 15 years. So big mistake on the part of Congress to not pass this resolution with an expiration date. And we are, our country is going to fix that in the future where you can't just use troops indefinitely. Now you have to put a time limit on how long you're going to use the troops uh, unless you declare a war, actually declare a war. So the fact that there's an open space there is a big mistake on Congress. So this happens in 1964, and over the next four years, that we go from having go from having hundreds of people in Vietnam, right? Advisors, just a few hundred soldiers, to over 500,000 people in 1968. So stark increase all the way up to a half million men and this is also matched by the soviet union supporting the north we're supporting the south soviet union and china supports the north so it really is a battle of ideologies happening in vietnam the good thing about this is that it's not happening in america it's not happening in a land-based battle in russia we're having this proxy war in vietnam 
North versus South, supported by America, supported by the Soviet Union, were kind of using the Vietnamese and their territory to have a proxy war. That's why Vietnam is called a proxy war. It's almost like it's instead of having this big open warfare, USA versus Russia, we have a smaller war in Vietnam. Now, it's not small to the people who are there, and it's super important to the people who got hurt and killed. Obviously, it changed their lives forever, but at least it wasn't some big global conflict like a World War III. Moves on to, so U.S. involvement in Vietnam, and this is a page on your screen there. Go ahead and write this. U.S. military got involved in Vietnam at the request of South Vietnam to protect them from a communist takeover by North Vietnam. Pretty similar to all the things I've already said. Just, uh, just trying to show you, um, just trying to give you that nice, tidy definition. So if you write that there, I want to set the scene for us by showing you what fighting in Vietnam was actually like. And the scene I'm going to set for you comes from a fictional movie. Why would I use a fictional movie? Because uh, we're at school, okay. Even though the story is fictional, what's shown on the screen is pretty accurate. Okay, so the movie I'm going to use is Forrest Gump. Y'all ever seen, yeah. ever seen Forrest Gump before? Mm -hmm. There's a portion of Forrest Gump where he fights in the Vietnam War. Obviously, the story, Forrest Gump, is totally fiction. But these couple minutes in Vietnam are pretty accurate. So I want you to pay attention to the uniforms, pay attention to the scenery, the grass, the water, the rain, pay attention to the soldiers, all that kind of stuff. Because even though the story is fictional, a lot of what you're going to see is pretty accurate. And it's going to kind of set the stage for the rest of us. Uh, we're talking about being on the rest of our class here, okay? Alright, sit back, relax, and enjoy the screen for a second. Here we go. <laughs> oh, wait, this is a tuna that's gonna be in it. Drop. I just remember the text on all the way. It wasn't always fun. Lieutenant Dan was always getting these funny feelings about the rock or the trail or the road. So he tell us to get down. Shut up. Get down. Shut up. Shut up. Right back against me. 
This way we don't have to sleep with our heads in the mud. Well, you know why we a good one to ship for? Because we be watching out for one another. Mm -hmm. Like brothers and stuff. Hey, folks, something I've been thinking about. Got a very important question to ask you. How would you like to go into the strengthening business and say? Okay. And I'll tell you what, I got it all figured out too. So many parents went, pay off the boat. So many pay off the guy. We can just live right over the boat. We ain't got to pay no rent. I'll be the captain. We can just work it together, split everything right down the middle. Now I'm telling you, 50 50. Hey, folks, all the shrimp you can eat. That's a fine idea. All right, what stood out to you about the clip there? What's something you noticed? The rain. The rain. What, what else did you, someone say? Oh, Romantic. Stripping injured. The rice paddies. Okay, yeah, that's a very Vietnamese thing, is they uh, collect rice from the rice paddies. When Bro got into the uh, little sewer thing. Uh, yeah, okay, when uh, Forrest Gump, when he uh, ran into that uh, uh, skinny area, what was that called? Tunnel rat. Yeah, called being a tunnel rat. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, what type of people were soldiers in the Vietnam War? Courageous. Courageous people, sure. So you got Dallas, he was from Cleveland. You got Phoenix, he was from... Uh, Phoenix. He was from... Phoenix. someplace else. In Texas, I just can't remember where Texas is from. What kind of soldiers made up Force Gump's platoon? Everybody. All types of people. Yeah, see that? Young. Young. Young and all, I would say, all socioeconomic groups. Skin color, family background, amount of income that your family made. A lot of people oh, went to Vietnam. All types of people. So that's a big takeaway. What's not one? Get down, shut up. I've been that lieutenant. I've told my guys to get down and shut up as well. So here's the quick setup, and I really got to kind of blast. I'm looking at my watch here, trying to get us through our story here. This is Vietnam, all right? A real skinny country. Now it kind of kind of fans out in the north and the south, but you see this real skinny strip right there. That is not a lot of territory to be playing with. This is also why Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, these were all part of the dominoes that might fall. If Vietnam falls to communism, that's why they felt like Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand would also fall to uh, to communism. North is communist, south is democratic, supported by the Soviet Union, supported by the Americans. Just a little bit of a blow up of that map. These red arrows here, I'll kind of briefly point out that a lot of times the attacks from the north would cut through Laos and then dive into South Vietnam. What's difficult about that is that the Americans were kind of confined to staying in South Vietnam. So the enemy, the bad guys, are coming they're from the, Yeah, they're cutting in, they're using different paths to conduct their attacks. That made it a pretty hard war to fight. That's all we wanted. Look at this. This is the United States, and that's Alaska. This is where Vietnam is. A lot of people didn't really understand where Vietnam was or why we were over there. I thought Alaska was down there by Hawaii. That is just not correct. Alaska is up there by Canada. Up there by Canada. Yeah, Hawaii is right about there, right? Right in the middle of the South Pacific. So anyway, anyway, long ways away, and a lot of people didn't understand why the United States was involved in this foreign conflict in Vietnam. Talk a little bit about the uh, leaders of the South of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh. Write this down, okay? Yeah, Write down. Find, find a little bit of a space there, because I don't have a space for it, and I apologize for that. Like just under the Vietnam War, Ho Chi Minh, he was the leader of the North Vietnamese, and their army gets nicknamed the Viet Cong, or you heard Forrest Gump say Charlie. A lot of times the nickname for the enemy was Charlie, because that comes off of the word Cong. Ho Chi Minh. I'm going to give you a little bit about, about the biography of Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was a lifelong soldier. Vietnam was a contested area long before the Americans got there. First it was the British, then it was the French, and then the Americans came. The Viet Cong beat the British, beat the French, and when the Americans rolled in, what do you think their attitude was? They're going to beat the Americans. Okay, who's next, right? Like we've been fighting our whole lives, who's next? 
Ho Chi Minh was one of those leaders. He was basically a general of the of the Viet Cong, and he uh, he is uh, kind of the chief enemy, at least in terms of the North Vietnamese. What he brought to the war was guerrilla style tactics. Now we've talked about guerrilla warfare before. What's the characteristic of guerrilla warfare? Yeah, run, hide, fight, ambush style attacks, live to fight another day. We talked about that in the American Revolution, and that's actually what changed the war for the Patriots. Well, in a jungle like Vietnam, that's actually what guerrilla warfare is very, very well suited for. Hiding behind all the all the vegetation pop up, shoot, fade back into the jungle. So these small scale guerrilla style attacks really are what characterizes the Vietnam War. And the problem for the Americans is that this was a different kind of war than we had just fought. We were used to fighting on big land, bringing all of our technology, our airplanes, our tanks, our missiles, our long range rifles. And we won World War II, we won in, in Korea. This is a very different war. You can see the dense vegetation, rainforest, swampy, rain, like big change from the war we've been fighting previously, World War II and Korea. We brought our tanks to the fight, and how good did they do in the jungle? <laughs> As you can see, this tank is still there. This is an American tank that just got bogged down and was never rescued. Yeah, it was never recovered, and it's still there to this day. So sometimes Americans have this attitude of we have enough technology to win any fight that we're in. Well, in this case, it was the wrong kind of technology. We didn't need tanks in the jungle. We didn't have an advantage from that technology. Now, well, it's not true for all technology. One piece of technology that comes out of the Vietnam War is the helicopter. First time that helicopters were used to transport soldiers into battle. It's actually called the air cavalry. Because cavalry, in the, in the previous era, what was a cavalry? What kind of a... Horses. Horses, yeah. Cavalry means horses. Well, this is the air cavalry. It's not horses, but helicopters that bring you to the battle. So uh, helicopters were a big change in technology, and it really did help the Americans out. Uh, here is a tunnel, much like you saw Forrest Gump going into a tunnel. The Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, having been fighting for decades, first the, French, first the British, then the French, now the Americans, they had a very built-up underground tunnel network. Much like we talked about the trench warfare of World War I, well, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, have a tunnel system. So look at that. A lot of times in America, we think that big and muscular is best, right? We want our MMA fighters to be all masculine and they're huge. You think a huge fighter could fit into a tunnel like that? No. Sometimes smaller is better. So even though that guy's not the most muscular dude around, uh, do you think he's capable of popping up, shooting some bullets, and popping back down? Yeah. Yeah, right? So... Biggest is not always bestest. This guy has his own advantages. And the Vietnamese people, they're actually physically smaller than Americans, right? Their genetics is oh, the way that they've developed over time. My shoulders are probably too broad for that, that tunnel right there. So I couldn't really fit into that tunnel. A couple of y'all are smaller. And just like you saw Forrest Gump, he, had, he was going into the tunnel. If you were the smaller guy in your platoon, you were probably going to be the tunnel rat. You were going to be the one who had to clear out the tunnels with just a pistol. The tunnels weren't only small. You can see that they open up, and there's kind of like a whole network there, even having space for the commanders to lay down their maps, have their uh, have their tables, and, you know, sit oh, down you and know. eat. Yeah, so it started as a very small tunnel, but it would open up into a broader underground network. The tunnels made for a very frustrating war for the Americans because the Viet Cong could pop up, shoot, 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 pop down, before the Americans even knew what direction it was coming from. Uh, a Soviet flag, that's right, because they were communists. That's exactly right, Abigail. Another thing that was uh, used a lot in the Vietnam War was booby traps. Booby traps. What you have here is called a punchy stick pit. I'm about to gross y'all out. Here's a better sketch of it, right? So this is an actual one. Here's the sketch of it. It would have a false floor, okay? So like some bamboo and some, some broad leaves kind of weaved together. And the point of it was when a heavy person, like a 200 pound man like me, would step onto it, that false ceiling would collapse, and underneath are these bamboo sharpened spikes, and what would happen to the person falling through? Get stabbed. Yeah, get stabbed, get spiked. A lot of times it actually didn't even kill the person, it just wounded them. But sometimes a wounded soldier is harder to take care of than a dead soldier. 
So the booby trap was designed to inflict maximum pain without necessarily killing the person because they knew that the Americans would then have to take that soldier back to their base. Uh, and sometimes it's just harder to care for, care for a wounded soldier than a dead soldier. They also would sometimes, I'm about to gross y'all out, you got your gross out face? Sometimes they'd apply poison, poison oh, yeah. of different varieties to these sticks. Maybe they take animal poison, like an animal or a poison dart frog or the venom from a snake, kind of put it on the tip of this spike. Maybe a plant, a plant that's poisonous, they can put that on the tip of the spike. But in a pinch, without any other poison available, Isaac's grinning. I, Isaac, what would they put onto the spikes? Human fecal matter. Who? Oh. Because when that spike went into a person, and put feces into a body as well, what is that? Poison. Bacteria. Bacteria. So now you're going to have a very infected wound. So that Isaac, good job for knowing that. The whole point of the booby traps is it made the whole jungle scary and threatening to the soldiers. They didn't know if their next step was going to push them through the ground or not. Mines and bombs and trip wires and all sorts of other booby traps that contributed to the Vietnam War being a very different war for the Americans. There's a variety of uh, bad things that come out of the Vietnam War as well. One is called the My Lay Massacre. The Americans, being very frustrated with how the war is going, because the enemy, they didn't wear uniforms. There's not a front line anymore. When we see the Germans in World War II, we know that they're the bad guys. But in Vietnam, these guys would shoot and then just kind of blend back into the population. They would wear regular clothes. You don't know who's good or who's bad. So there are stories of American platoons massacring whole villages because if those villages were harboring or hiding enemy fighters, sometimes the Americans, I'm not saying it's the right thing, it's a crime, but they'd be frustrated and they'd murder the whole village. Even in one terribly tragic uh, situation is called the Miley Massacre, where this village called Miley was believed to be harboring fighters. However, when the platoon actually got there, the people in the village were mostly women, children, and old men. Not, not fighting men, but old men. Well, the platoon didn't care, and they murdered upwards of 300 innocent individuals. Uh, and that just kind of speaks to the tragedy of the Vietnam War, is that a bunch of, uh, a bunch of bad things happened during it as well. So the My Lai Massacre is one um, option that you have for reading a little bit extra. There's some photos, so I'll give you kind of the warning that if you don't want to read that one because there's some there's some real photos in there, uh, you, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to read that. But if you want to know more about the My Life Massacre, that's one of those articles that you can read. Five past this. There's a uh, there's a unrest at home as well. It's a very unpopular war. People are being drafted into service. They didn't necessarily volunteer to go serve. So if your number got called, you had to go serve. A lot of people tried to avoid the draft for that very reason. Sometimes our future presidents were accused of being draft dodgers because they did not go and serve in Vietnam. Bill Clinton is one of those who did not serve in Vietnam, so he's, be, he's accused of dodging the draft during the 1960s. Suffice it to say, there's a lot of unrest. People were not supportive of the dying that was happening overseas, and there's a lot of rallies that kind of make their voices heard uh, but, but just all around the country. This is Washington, D.C., and this is California and everything in between. So a lot of the country disapproved of what was going on in Vietnam. Um, leads to what is known as the Tet Offensive. And this is on your screen, so I'm going to give this to you right here. Right this. Tet Offensive was a coordinated series of attacks where the North Vietnamese attacked about 100 different cities at pretty much the same time. And it really caught the Americans off guard. Tet is a holiday. It's almost like a, it's like New Year. It's the Buddhist New Year, and Vietnam is mostly a Buddhist country. So because uh, because it was a holiday, the Americans thought that the Vietnamese would not be attacking. But you know what? Our own country was founded by a guy who attacked on Christmas night. George Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas night. So we got caught off guard. We got very caught off guard, and the Tet Offensive was a pretty bad time in the war for the Americans. Also, during this time period, television played a big role because we were able to see uh, these images were able to be shown back home. And uh, a lot of Americans started to see their sons and brothers and cousins and neighbors wounded and dying on television on a nightly basis. 
So whereas in the past it was only radio, you could hear about it or newspaper. Newspaper would bring reports several days Whoa. later. This is a uh, television coming into your home and showing you on a nightly basis the fact that we are kind of losing the war. Our leaders tried to say we were winning the war. The president and the general, they tried to say we were winning the war, but the images, the images showed otherwise, showed that we were losing the war. So the Tet Offensive in 1968 was a big change in the war because Americans started to realize we were not winning the war, we were losing the war, and we don't like that. We don't like seeing that on our TV screens on a nightly basis. I'm gonna click past a couple of extra slides here, things I've kind of already said. So here are Americans watching the television. Vietnam is often called a television war, one of the first wars that was shown on TV on a nightly basis instead of reports coming long after the fact. And these are the types of images that Americans were seeing. What if that's your brother? What if that's your cousin? What if that's the kid down the street? Same I'm a high school teacher and I taught that young man the year before, right? He was in my senior class. Well, now I'm like, whoa, wait a second. Look bloodied and battered and retreating on their tank. That's not the American way. So that turns my support against the war. It turns a lot of Americans' support against the war. So these images coming through the television screen, that was a pretty significant, significant piece. In the end, um, the Tet Offensive had a big impact on the presidential election as well because America wanted to change presidents. We saw President Johnson was not doing a very good job. He was not leading the, uh, the war towards a victory. So he actually decides to not run for president and that opens the door for a new president to come in. That new president is President Nixon. Nixon promises to end the war and it takes him a couple years, but he does. The reason he wants to end the war is to reestablish relationships with the world. Basically, our reputation kind of took a hit uh, at this time. People used to see America as a superpower, yay for us, but 12, 15 years of Vietnam and we're not really winning the war, all of a sudden we don't see our, we're not on the world stage as the winners anymore. So Nixon wants to bring it into the Vietnam War to kind of restore our reputation on the, uh, on the world stage. And he does this through a process called Vietnamization. You see the chart there? Very few troops, maximum number of troops, that's the peak. And then we're going to draw back down. Vietnamization was a gradual withdrawal of troops. And the big idea was to give responsibility back to the South Vietnamese. Hey, we tried, we came, it didn't work out. Clearly this is your problem, not ours. So we're gonna just withdraw ourselves from the party over here and good luck to you. That's kind of what it was. Uh, we promised that we would continue to help them, but we actually kind of back out on that promise uh, and I'll show you a picture of that here in just a second as well. So the idea was that we gotta get out and guess what? It's basically just a civil war between the North and the South at this point. Once the Americans leave, it'll be a civil war between the North and the South. So you're writing down Vietnamization. I will post this to Google Classroom. I know I kind of went warp speed here at the end. Vietnamization was withdrawing from Vietnam, transferring responsibility to the South Vietnamese. All right, I gotta get to the end before the bell. Um, and, and this is, this is the Americans leaving Vietnam. This is actually the last helicopter out of Saigon, which is the capital city of the South. And you can see this is the American embassy. These people are clamoring to get onto this helicopter because as soon as the Americans leave, the North Vietnamese are gonna sweep on in and probably kill anyone who has helped the Americans along the way. What Abigail asked earlier, is there still North and South Vietnam to this day? The answer is no. North Vietnam reinvades the South 1975. It is now one Vietnam and it is a communist country. So we tried to contain communism in Vietnam by supporting South Vietnam. It didn't work. We lost the war. The North Vietnamese swept on in. All of our efforts in South Vietnam for about 15 years are totally wiped out. Everyone who died along the way, some people wonder if their sacrifice mattered. Now it matters on a personal basis, but in terms of the politics, North Vietnam won. So, uh, so it's kind of a difficult thing for Americans to swallow. Here's a very powerful picture. The picture on the left is the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan just this past year. The picture on the right is the U.S. evacuation from Saigon. Very, very eerily similar images 
uh, leaving South Vietnam almost in defeat, leaving Afghanistan kind of with a mixed mixed emotions almost in defeat as well. So it's kind of a really sad, really sad double combination uh, or comparison that you can make between Vietnam and Afghanistan. I'd like to give a, here's the big summary. So in Vietnam, the United States, we gradually increased our involvement. Purpose was to contain communism. First, we gave aid, then we gave training, then we actually put our troops in combat. So that's the progression. First, we'll give you money, then we'll give you training, then we're actually going to put our troops in combat. But in the end, it costs more than the American public was willing to, uh, to pay uh, in terms of money and lives. We did not like seeing our friends dying on TV on a nightly basis, so we demanded that we come home. Now I'll give you this, a lot of people in this community wear those black veteran hats, black hat, gold lettering. If you see someone in and around town wearing a veteran hat, I would challenge you, shake their hand, tell them thank you, right? A lot. It's easy to say thank you for your service, but ask them for a life lesson too. If they're wearing a hat and they're willing to talk about it, right? I know everyone's war experiences are different. Uh, they're willing to talk about it, ask them about it. There's mother's day, but we can't forget that. Um, you have a lot to do. Like, you're alive, because you have a lot to do. Um, so we have a lot going on with higher education today. We're going to have a lot of kids. Sign off. We, we out, y'all. We are. Please disseem. We will have a career fair. Going on in our main hallway, in the foyer area, um, during the section, it will begin the wide clear plaza.